Hello and welcome to a brand new discussion-based podcast. Um, we haven't done one of these in a while, actually. Um, with me, Ed Wallet, and Stephen Wing. So hello, Stephen. Hello. Yeah, and hello. This... <laughs> that went well. Um, we are doing this over um, Skype. Actually, we're not in the same place. Um, and what we thought we'd do is we have a quick chat um, all about plural effusions because somehow plural effusion seems not to have been covered on the site. Um, so a little bit of something different um, in a number of ways. One, we're doing it remotely. And two, we're actually going to be looking at plural effusions, but we're going to use a paper to do that. We're going to be um, looking at a paper published by the uh, British Thoracic Society, um, in particular their most recent guidelines on plural disease. And we're going to use that as a kind of framework um, for explaining the basics of plural effusions. That's pretty much right, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's um, it's worth looking at these guidelines. There are all sorts of guidelines published now at the moment. But when we bear in mind that I read something last week that there are some 75 randomised clinical trials and 11, um, 11 meta-analyses published every single day, clinical guidelines are becoming very, very useful. Yeah. So it's worth looking these up on the website. I mean, and there's a figure that's commonly quoted now that in order to stay up to date in a specific specialty, you know, you need to be reading 10 or 15 papers um, a week, um, which I don't know how long it takes you to read a paper, but um, for me, it takes quite a bit of time. I mean, you're looking at a lot of time. So getting, getting used to running through papers and extracting the most important information is quite a, a crucial skill and in the future is going to become an even more important um, skill in medicine, I think. Yeah, exactly. So, we're, obviously, we're going to talk about plural effusions. Um, so, let's start by just saying, well, what is a plural effusion? Um, most of you will probably be familiar with the concept of the lungs having a double-layered lining, or called the pleura, um, the visceral pleura in contact with the lung surface, and the uh, parietal pleura outside, and then this, this gap in between, which is usually filled with a very small amount of fluid. Now, in a number of conditions, you can get more fluid accumulating. Um, and when that happens, it's called an effusion. One of the consultants I once worked with explained it really well to me. And if you kind of think about the pleura as like a blown up balloon and the lungs push into the balloon. So if you were to, as, it, as if you were to push your fist into a, a very stretchy balloon, the lungs push into this balloon so that there were sort of two um, layers that the lungs invaginate on. That's not a naughty word, but I think it's a good way to, to think about it. Yeah. And um, just maybe a bit of anatomy as well, Ed, if, if, if you're up for it, because I think it's useful when you're thinking about some surface anatomy. It's useful when you're thinking about pleural effusions, especially examination. Yeah, go for it. So um, the apex is about two centimetres above the medial third of the clavicle, and that's where the, the pleural cavity starts. And the pleural cavity descends inferiorly and, and slightly medially, and they meet actually in the midline of the second intercostal cartilage. And then they, they, they both continue down inferiorly. But bear in mind that the on the left-hand side, you've got to make space for the heart. So the pleural reflection on the left-hand side goes laterally much quicker and earlier than the uh, pleural reflection on the right. And it starts to move away from the right from the midline in the, around the fourth costal cartilage. Well, the right just continues down minding its own business till it gets to the sixth costal cartilage. And then at that point, they both are going laterally um, and they, they're at the same level in the midclavicular line around the eighth costal cartilage. They continue around laterally mm. at the 10th costal cartilage, uh, costal cartilage at the mid axillary line. And in posteriorly, they're at the level of the 12th rib. So that's really useful to remember. The other thing, and uh, there's a good mnemonic that you can use to remember that, and it's just remembering the numbers. So two, four, six, and eight is the the the, the anterior side. So remember the apex is two. Uh, sorry, uh, the midline. They meet at the midline at two. They um, the the left pleural reflection goes away at the fourth, the right at the sixth. They're at the same level at the eighth. They and then they go round. And th just remember that the lung spaces are two, usually around two depending on whether it's inspiration or expiration, but in expiration, they're two centimetres above the pleural reflection, superior to that. Fantastic. Oh God, I didn't remember any of that stuff. But you yeah. should, you should. 
<laughs> it's quite it's quite useful to remember when you're going to stick needles in people's chests and stuff. So yes, well we don't really we don't do that a lot anymore, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah. Um, so why are we doing the podcast? Well, it's common both to see in hospital and of course in exams. Obviously, we're not just talking about exams, but obviously the more common things in exams are things that you're going to want to sort of revise more. Um, we're going to go on to talk about in a second what actually causes a pleural effusion, what causes this accumulation of fluid within the pleural space. Um, but essentially, the, the idea that you want to have in your mind is that it's there um, because of either increased fluid formation or reduced fluid um, resorption from that particular space. Good. So, what are the causes of a pleural effusion you've probably got some fancy way of thinking about this no actually i mean most classifications um or a lot of them in medicine are, are sort of dreamed up based on the way we used to examine things histologically but i really like this classification transudates versus exudates because um it's actually clinically useful and it it says something about how you're going to manage the patient. So you'll manage a patient with a transudate very much differently to someone with an exudate, and the causes are very different. So I really like this classification. Yeah, and also I, I think it's nice because it makes sense if you go back to basic principles. Um, mm -hmm. We all learnt about, um, as it's Starling and the, the laws of the way fluids move, um, mm -hmm. in particular between um, the arterial and venous end at the, in a capillary circuit. Yep. Um, and this ties very nicely into that. And maybe this is a good point to actually talk about what exactly is a transudate, what exactly is an exudate. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think um, a lot, uh, for, for me, my, some of my preclinical stuff seems very much disconnected from some of the clinical work. And it's good to go back and review some of these topics that are relevant as you're studying clinical medicine. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, um, Let's just review, actually, that basic Starling's uh, diagram. Essentially, in that diagram, it's talking about the way um, interstitial fluid is, is, is formed and then reabsorbed in, at the capillary end of the circulatory circuit. And basically, it talks about the different factors that determine how much fluid or where the fluid goes out and where it comes back in. So at the arterial end, where there's a higher pressure, you've got fluid moving out into the interstitium um, and then at the um, at the venous end when the pressure is reduced you've got the effect of the oncotic pressure in the blood pulling fluid back in um, through a pro process of osmosis and then on the background of that and this becomes important when we're thinking about exudates you've got a constant which is the permeability of the actual capillary itself and in the initial um, sort of non-pathological scenario, that would be constant. Your permeability would be the same. So if we apply this to transudate and exudate, in an exudate, basically the permeability of the capillaries or the, the, the vasculature has been altered in, in some way um, because of inflammation, because of malignancy. And that has disturbed this fluid balance and has allowed water to move out and not be absorbed as well and, and the balance to be disturbed. But the way that we tell the difference is because the protein is high and the reason the protein is high is because the protein itself has actually leaked because of the change in permeability. With transudates on the other hand the, the problem is with more with the actual pressure, the oncotic um, pressure and the pressure within the systems themselves and we'll see that the causes actually correspond with that so some of the causes are there because the for example the pressure at the venous side is increased so you've got less of that drop of pressure from arterial to venous and sometimes there's an accumulation also because the oncotic pressure of the blood itself has changed for example conditions hypoalbuminemia and things like that but if you just keep in mind that very basic Starling diagram of, of tissue reabsorption, it really enables you to sort of conceptualize what are, are the processes going on with transudates and exudates. Yeah, it's very good. And just to sort of tag on to the end of that, don't forget the lymphatic system, which mops up the rest of the uh, tissue fluid and takes it back and dumps it into the venous system via the oesophagus vein in, in the thorax. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
So going back into our um, paper, do you want to talk about transi dates? Uh, the causes, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think this is a really good way of splitting things, and you see this um, a lot in a lot of the MRCP uh, books that are published by the Royal College of Physicians, and I really like the way they've classified it into very common causes, less common causes, and rare causes. Um, and I think your consultant would appreciate it when you're giving him. He asks for a list of causes and you're trying to give them to him to, to order it in some sort of way, and this is a very good way, um, as common things they say are common. Um, so the very common cause of uh, a transulate is uh, left ventricular failure. Yeah. And in some papers it's estimated that um, in congestive heart failure, so pleural effusions may be present in up to sort of 87%, that, that high. So it is very, very common. Hmm. And from um, a pathophysiological point of view, why does it occur? Why do you get an accumulation of fluid with left ventricular failure? Well, when you've got decreased cardiac output, you've also got backlog of pressure as well, as there's a sort of a low forward flow. And as you were saying earlier about the Starling hypothesis, this, this increased pressure forces tissue fluid through the membrane, um, and that can often exceed the, the colloid oncotic pressure's ability to reabsorb it, so you do get accumulation in the tissues. Yeah. And that's why we get o pitting oedema in, in the dependent areas. If they're standing up, it's the legs. Yeah. And that actually, the next cause satisfies the sort of other defect that you can get in the Starling hypothesis, doesn't it? Absolutely. So liver cirrhosis is, is a cause of hyperalbuminemia as well. So decreased protein, because obviously the liver is responsible for protein synthesis. So a low protein is going to be a cause of a transudate. Yeah. So those are your two big, big groups, really. Um, other causes um, are low albumin, and that can be for many reasons. One of them we've got down on the list as well. So nephrotic syndrome. Um, and nephrotic syndrome is a triad. I think we've discussed in uh, one of the renal podcasts, Ed. Mm. Renal so medicine in 50 minutes. Mm, very good. So it might be <laughs> worth looking at that one. Um, and um, hyperalbuminemia can be a result of nephrotic syndrome. And nephrotic syndrome, you're losing protein through the urine and therefore you decrease your colloid oncotic pressure. Um, hyperalbuminemia could be, uh, result, could be re re resulting in uh, because of deficiency. Peritoneal dialysis, this is kind of um, self-explanatory really. In peritoneal dialysis, um, a patient with renal failure um, is given the ability to be able to use their peritoneum as a dialyzing membrane to take over some of the function of the kidneys for them. And this involves exchanging fluid into the peritoneum. And this fluid can obviously leak into the pleural cavity through the the membrane and the and through um, different membranes and cause a pleural effusion. So that's another cause. They put mitral stenosis here, which is quite interesting. I mean, it is a recognised cause of pleural effusion, and if you think about it, it it's uh, mitral stenosis is you know worldwide most common cause is rheumatic mitral stenosis. And it gives us the uh, mid-diastolic murmur with an opening snap. But this causes back pressure increasing the hydrostatic forces and can cause a pleural effusion. Um, but I don't know why they've put that in um, isolation, rather because other valvular disease can also cause pleural effusion. Mm. But um, it is a very common, uh, a, a common cause worldwide, I would imagine. No, absolutely, absolutely. And then they've got some rare causes at the bottom there, the ones that your consultant does not want to hear at the top of the list, particularly Meg uh, syndrome or Mig syndrome or whatever it's called. Yeah, so Meg Me syndrome is um, an ovarian fibroma, isn't it, Ed? Yeah, associated usually with a left-sided pleural effusion, isn't it? Yeah, or, or is it right? Or is it right? That's one to look up for you <laughs> and help you remember it. Yeah. Um, so Meek syndrome, I think we should attach to the end of that. Um, something that I've seen that I found very interesting was ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in a lady who was undergoing in vitro fertilization. So that can also be a very rare cause of a pleural effusion. Yeah. That's interesting. Lots of causes, but the two most important, left ventricular failure, liver cirrhosis. And if you remember those two, it will almost remind you of the two important mechanisms of transudate. So changes in pressure and changes in oncotic um, mm. forces. And the differential here is, is you know, is, is really wide in pleural effusion, both with transudates and exudates. So it's really important to be systematic about the way you approach things. Yeah, absolutely. 
So if we move on to plural exudates, once again, we've got this common cause, less common and rare cause classification. Um, if you remember, when we're talking about plural exudates, what we're talking about is changes in the permeability. Um, so that constant has changed, that allows an imbalance between um, fluid, um, fluids in the interstition to occur, and there tends to be a buildup. Now, the most common causes, as you might imagine, stuff like malignancy, which is invasive, gets around, kind of invades the, the, the vasculature um, and changes the very substance um, of the lung and, and changing that causes changes in this permeability which cause protein loss and fluid loss. The other big group is um, inflammatory um, sort of changes within the, the vasculature which occur secondary to um, sort of infective processes. So paraneumonic effusions is essentially a sort of swanky way of saying an, a pleural effusion that's associated with a pneumonia um, and obviously tuberculosis as well as an infective process and then actually if you look down the list um, certainly towards pulmonary embolism um, you can see there again we're talking about um, we're talking about actually that's change in pressure isn't it pulmonary embolism but it can also be uh, cause lots of inflammation um, and you know the tissue necrosis that occurs with pulmonism can cause inflammation and that can cause a, an exudated pleural effusion as well. So I guess there's a number of reasons patients with pulmonary embolism end up with a pleural effusion. But it's not something that's that common with pulmonary embolism, I think. I've not seen it. It's not, I don't think often. it's commonly detected. Um, I, believe it's, it's, I believe it's more common than we think it is, but um, not commonly detected. Anyway, moving down the list, rheumatoid arthritis, once again, autoimmune pleuritis, these are all inflammatory yeah, and the paraneumonic effusions, just to sort of add, they they, they occur um, probably most commonly with um, streptococcal pneumonia. It's quite well well renowned to cause paraneumonic effusions, mm. and people with um, pneumonia get paraneumonic effusions in around twenty to sixty percent, depending on which paper you look at. Um, so that's that's one to watch out for and the reason that you should be examining patients with pneumonia on a daily basis is to avoid um, avoid undetection of paraneumonic effusions yeah um should we go through empyemas and lung abscesses because that's a sort of question that's um co asked quite a lot by the surgical doctors to medical students and mm. it's important distinction so i often ask people um what's the difference between a lung abscess or, or, or let's just say the generic abscess or an empyema and the answer is really that an abscess is um, a collection of pus that occurs within an unnatural body cavity whereas an empyema is an abscess or, or sorry a pus uh, a collection of pus that occurs within a body cavity that's already defined and one of those cavities is um, the pleural space. So paraneumonic effusions after a time can solidify and become empyemas. So that's, uh, we'll talk a bit about that maybe a bit later when we go through management. Yeah. Should we move on? Yeah, we see drugs down there as well. Um, some of the drugs that can cause um, para uh, the, the um, exudated pleural effusions are also the ones that can cause fibrosis. So methotrexate, amiodarone and nitrofurantonin they're, they're the three, really, that you need to think of as the ones causing lung problems. And they can cause, as I said, both um, fibrosis and um, exudated pleural effusions, but also fentonin and beta blockers are well-renowned cause, uh, causes. Mm, one for the EMQs. Mm. Let's move on. Yeah, so what are the clinical features now? Um, the clinical features, when you're thinking about pleural effusions, you can sort of think about, well, what are the clinical features? What are the aspects of the history and the examination that make me think that there is an effusion there? And then on the other hand, what are the aspects of the history and examination which might guide me towards um, a clue about the cause of the effusion, i.e. whether it's broadly a transudate or an exudate, or indeed whether it's something more specific, such as left ventricular failure or pulmonary malignancy um, or infection. Um, so yeah. do, do you want to talk us through how the, the basic sort of how to detect uh, an effusion clinically? On examination? Mm. Yeah, so with, with every respiratory examination, you should be doing, you know, the following thing. So you should always inspect because palpate and auscultate. And there's the sort of basic um, two examination that we all learn. 
Um, and we'll just take, I guess, take each one in turn and just discuss some of the things you might see. So um, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the thoracic signs rather than um, rather than the extra thoracic signs. But I guess when looking at extra, extra thoracic signs, you should be looking at different causes of effusion. Let's just talk about thoracic first because it's the one that we all want to hear. So on inspection, you should really look for decreased uh, chest expansion on the side of the pleural effusion. So asymmetrical chest expansion. And this is usually best done um, behind the patient. And uh, we will should chest, uh, chest expansion when you um, palpate as well. But it's always better to look. And you can also see any evidence of previous scars, um, so thoracotomy scars, um, as we saw post coronary artery bypass graft was a cause of an exudative pleural effusion. So look for other scars and other scars for chest strains suggesting they may have had something wrong in the past. Then you can move on to palpation. And I think first you should be palpating for any tracheal deviation because large pleural effusions can cause deviation of the tracheum and the, and the mediastinum away from the pleural effusion. And if that happens, they, it's, it's uh, an indication that they need to have a drainage. So um, always look for tracheal deviation. But the main thing on palpation, in addition to chest expansion, is tactile vocal fremitus. So tactile vocal fremitus is where you palpate the chest for the low frequency vibrations that are transmitted through the patient's voice. And you, you should ask the patient to speak. Um, I usually use the words boy and toy, um, but sort of we mostly in the UK I think say 99 and I think this goes from one of the original papers that described it, it was a German paper and they asked you to say uh, nuns und nunzig which is I think 99 in German, I don't speak German. Uh, Sounded pretty convincing to me. <laughs> Do you speak German? Ed? No I don't. No. No. <laughs> but it's, it's the nasal oi sound, the oi sound that we want to hear so anything that um, causes that, and 99 is, is okay but uh, boy and toy are much better sounds for you to hear those low frequency um, uh, vibrations. Just be careful who you say that to. Boy and toy, yeah. Mm. And don't say them together, I guess. <laughs> the patients might get angry and think that you're uh, <laughs> insinuating something. Yeah. <laughs> so um, large pleural effusions cause reduction in the transmission of these low frequency sounds. And um, there are other differentials that, um, like, you know, like a pneumothorax and pleural thickening, um, but we won't go here. But just to, to point out that you get an increase in tactile vocal fremitus in consolidation. So bear in mind that we'll go on to that in a bit later. Then let's go on to percussion. So in percussion, there's the uh, there's two different techniques actually. There's one that everybody uses all the time, and there's one that I've used occasionally but not routinely. And conventional percussion is uh, the kind of thing that you learn at the start of your third year and it's where you place either the second or third finger very firmly on the part of the body you want to percuss, in this case the thorax, and then tap it hard with your, the middle finger of your dominant hand in different places throughout the anterior and posterior thorax to try and listen and feel for the resonance. And it's always really impressive. I don't know if you found, if you've seen someone examining uh, a patient and they've got a really loud percussion. And I think it always sounds really impressive. It's probably something to practice, get good at for your exams. Even though actually I find in real life, percussion is much, you, you tell most through percussion from the feel of someone's chest rather than the sound that it makes. Yeah, um, absolutely. But uh, that's something that, you know, I suppose comes with experience. And for the purpose of an exam, you have to be able to show that you can do it. So I was saying that um, there are some papers out there to say that dullness of percussion and tactile vocal fremitus are the most useful findings for a pleural effusion. They've got the most uh, sensitivity and specificity. Yeah. Um, but the differential of percussion, so you've got dull, dullness to percussion is what you hear on uh, and feel when you percuss a chest with a pleural effusion over that area that's got the pleural effusion. And it's usually described as stony dull. And the differential of dullness to percussion is consolidation, um, particularly in pneumonia, any pleural thickening or collapse of the lung, atelectasis, or an elevated hemidiaphragm. Then you move on to auscultation, so you're going to be listening. And the sort of three things you should be listening for when you use your stethoscope is the intensity of any breath sounds, the transmission of spoken words, and the presence of any adventitious sounds. 
And with regard to a pleural effusion, you'll get reduced or absent intensity of breath sounds over the pleural flu uh, effusion itself. So if you think of it like a, a barrier to the sound reaching you, that fluid in the intrapleural space, you also get uh, decreased vocal resonance and you can get crackles where the, um, the terminal alveoli are and the bronchioles are, are collapsed that, due to the pressure of the effusion itself and open with a big inspiration. And sometimes if you've got a very small pleural effusion and the, the layers the, of the, the visceral and parietal layers of the fluid are touching, you may hear an a, a audible pleural rub. So that's something to listen out for. Yeah. So those are all the examination findings, basically, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, should we say about the difference between effusion and consolidation? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Because that's, um, that's really important. So you're listening to someone's chest. And you know they've got pneumonia and, and you're sort of listening, you're trying to work out, do they have a paraneumonic effusion or not? Um, in consolidation, you're going to get an increase in tactile vocal fremitus, as I've said before, whereas in effusion, you'll get decreased tactile vocal fremitus. Also, the percussion note for effusion and, um, and consolidation is very different. So it will be dull in consolidation, whereas very, very dull, or, or what's described as stony dull in a, a pleural effusion. And also, in, uh, in consolidation, the trachea will always be central and never be deviated. So if you see a deviated trachea, this suggests that there's something else is going on. Perhaps it could be an effusion. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's how you essentially would detect an effusion clinically on the patient. Um, I don't think it's worth going through in detail all the things that one could look for on the patient that might suggest the cause of this effusion. But I suppose common things are common. So, for example, if this was left ventricular failure, um, you may see somebody, for example, with a scar on their chest, possibly from a previous um, artery bypass grafting, scar on the leg. Um, they may also have peripheral edema, a swollen abdomen, a particularly large puffy edematous face, and maybe even a raised JVP. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of malignancy, you might see clubbing. So you, if you remember, all examinations start at the hand. Um, the particular feature you might look for there would be, uh, would be clubbing. Um, and when you move uh, up the arm um, and up to the neck, um, you will also look for any signs of um, cyanosis um, and any signs perhaps on the anterior chest wall or spider nevi that might suggest liver disease on the abdominal exam you might find an enlarged liver see suddenly when you once you become aware of the various common causes of things you're much more likely to elicit and put everything together so try and think of your examinations not in terms of just looking for one thing but of looking for multiple things and then putting all the pieces together yeah and and, and the BTS actually make a point of saying that clinical assessment alone is often capable of identifying transudative effusions. And that's important because you don't want to send the patient through unnecessary investigations. So a really good history, particularly noting down, you know, things like, uh, do you have any heart disease? And, and something I um, used to miss a lot was the occupational history, really important in a pleural effusion. Asbestos and the like, uh, particularly. Yeah, exactly. Good, and, and this is just a, a part of that paper to, to say a history and physical examination of a patient may guide the clinician as to whether the effusion is transudative or exudative, and also that clinical assessment alone is often able, able of identifying transudative effusions. Mm -hmm. So let's move on now to the diagnostic algorithm. Um, we could have started with this, but I, I kind of thought that it would be better just to give a bit of background because suddenly if you if you if you understand what a pleural effusion is if you understand how you diagnose it and you understand the basic common causes the algorithm suddenly makes sense it's not something that has to be memorized it's something that really makes sense so at the top um, we've got history clinical examination which we've done and we've got chest x-ray which is the main initial radiological investigation that's used when a pleural effusion is suspected and we'll have a look at a chest x-ray of a pleural effusion in a moment and then notice how the next point is does the clinical picture suggest a transudate for example secondary to LVF left ventricular failure a low protein level in the blood or is the patient's on dialysis if it does then it's recommended to give a trial of treatment of that specific cause. So for example, if the patient had left ventricular failure, the patient would be given diuretics um, if they were symptomatic, and then the um, pleural effusion would be re reviewed to see if it had resolved. 
If not, if the clinical picture does not see death, suggest a definite transient date, or the treatment or trial of treatment fails, then the next step, um, if you just ignore referral to a chest physician for the moment, is to perform a pleural aspiration, as that can give you a lot of information, both definitively whether it's an exudate or a transudate, and also what the most likely cause might be to then further define your management. Absolutely. We'll come on to that again later. But going back to the chest x-ray, Ed, I think the paper says something very explicit about chest x-rays. Um, and I thought, thought it was interesting that they say that uh, a PA chest x-ray is abnormal in the presence of around 200 mils of fluid. Mm. It seems mm. quite a lot, but they do go on to say that 50 mils of fluid can be detected um, at the posterior costophrenic angle uh, uh, when you see blunting yes. on the lateral film. But we don't do lateral films often. I don't know if you do them in your hospital, but uh, certainly no. not in the ones I've worked at. No. Maybe there are some other imaging techniques that would be more sensitive. Mm. We'll find out. We'll find out. So we've been through this very basic algorithm. So what are these important investigations? Um, Let's start with the chest x-ray. Yeah, we can do. We won't go into talking how to to, to look at x-rays properly because um, we've got some other stuff on that elsewhere on the website. But the striking abnormality is on the left-hand side where you've got this um, a pacification um, that seems to go up like a meniscus. And it's very characteristic of a pleural effusion. Yeah, and lateral peaking of the right hemidiaphragm as well can be seen. Yeah. But the main, the main point to take away here is that, that characteristic feature of um, menisci and uh, pulmonary effusion. Absolutely. So, would you do a CT? Um, you could do. It's certainly in the diagnostic algorithm. Um, but you might want to have a look at some other things first, i.e. Whether, uh, whether you think that it's a transudate or an exudate. Because um, you were saying before, the diagnostic algorithm says if you think it's a transidate, you should try this trial of treatment. Yeah, exactly. But it um, does look quite nice. I mean, it's quite nice to visualise. Uh, on this CT, you can, you can see quite clearly, I hope, um, a pulmonary effusion um, on the right side. Yep, and CTs on the algorithm, which we'll, uh, we'll come to a bit later. Yeah, and just as an aside, I don't think you'll see this done very much. But the, the, the guidelines do suggest that um, ultrasound detects um, pleural fluid um, septations, particularly uh, with greater sensitivity than uh, CT. And imp very importantly, um, ultrasound guidance or the use of ultrasound when you're actually performing an aspiration now is pretty much um, mandatory. Um, I think that's a recent change, isn't it? Yes, there's a recent change to the last published um, guidelines on chest drain insertion and pleural aspiration. Um, because ultrasound guidance reduces the incidence of any um, of any arteriogenic complications such as pneumothorax or perforation of a viscous. Hmm. Um, and that it's much better. I think some hospitals do an X mark the spot method where I think they go down to radiology and have an ultrasound they have a little X put on where the uh, where they think you should go to aspirate it, send them back to the ward, and it's left to the doctors looking after the patient to do the chest drain or aspiration. Mm. Um, and this this sort of method is not as good as doing it at the bedside where you're doing the aspiration because the patient may be in a different position from where that ultrasound was done before. So lots of hospitals are moving to bedside ultrasound and aspiration and or drain depending on what they find on the ultrasound. So go, go, going back to the septations thing, um, the most sort of common things that cause septations, these are sort of areas of um, fibrous stranding within the pleural fluid itself and makes you think of infection and malignancy. Yeah. And um, it's very difficult to drain these ones sometimes because you get loculated effusions where you get pockets or uh, lakes of fluid. Um, that if you do stick a drain into one of them, you may not be reaching the body of the fluid. So it's important to do an ultrasound um, because we can see whether it's loculated or not and, and decide on the best place for an aspiration or drain. Yeah. What were you saying, Ed? Uh, I was just going to go on to the next bit. Okay, let's go. Um, so the next bit we come to is... Um, say that you've done your trial of, of, of treatment because you suspected a transudate. There's been very little radiological or clinical 
improvement in the patient. You referred to a chest physician um, and you have been asked um, to perform a pleural tap. Um, now, the guidelines here, in fact, about 50% of this of, of the guidelines talk about the various tests that you can do and the significance or various results of those tests. But still, the things that you really want to focus on in your mind to memorize the kind of things you need to think about are to think about the different departments that you send um, the fluid that you take off. So mm, I just, yeah, I just tend to think that I'm going to send some fluid off to biochemistry, some off to microbiology, and some off to cytology. And mm -hmm. then I think, well, why would I want to do that? And this is where, so biochemistry, what you're interested in is the LDH and the protein. If you remember earlier, we spoke about um, protein, particularly the level of protein being indicative of uh, whether a, 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 a pleural effusion is a transudate or an exudate. And the LDH as well is going to tell you that. Um, and we'll talk in a moment more specifically about the, the levels because there is an important um, level that differentiates between the two that you do need to know and a set of criteria that if you're very keen, you can, you can learn about. Microscopy and culture. Um, this is... Um, obviously, if you're suspecting um, any type of paraneumonic um, effusion or tuberculosis-based um, effusion, you want to culture um, the, the fluid to see if there's any growth, and also you want to stick it under the microscope and look at the type of cells that are there as well. And then lastly, you've got your cytological examination and differential cell count. So this is most focused on the malignancy side of things, looking for abnormal cells in the aspirate that might suggest a malignant process going on. Mm, not always diagnostic, though. Absolutely not, no. And then there's lots of other things here. I'm sure Stephen will know all about these. <laughs> um, do you? Do you want to talk about any of them? Yeah, they're often very useful. So um, pH, really important if you've got someone with pneumonia and you're suspecting, based on your clinical examination, of course, they could have a paraneumonic effusion. So you want to take um, some of that pleural aspirate and put it in a blood gas syringe and take it to um, a blood gas machine. Um, preferably um, ask whoever's uh, responsible for that blood gas machine um, before you start sticking pleural fluid through it because some of the gas machines can't take it. And the significance of this is that if there is um, the pleural fluid is acidotic and some figures quote less than 7.3 or less than 7.2, this suggests that there's an empyemia and they need a chest strain to get that out because uh, antibiotics alone are not as effective. So they need a chest strain. So that's really important to take the pH. Glucose, again, is um, quite important, um, particularly rheumatoid arthritis is associated with a very, very low um, glucose level. And it's also low in some of infections and, uh, and tuberculosis as well. In high um, areas where, the, in high prevalence areas where you've got lots of TB around, particularly uh, where I'm working at the moment in East London, you'll almost certainly want to send it for um, acid and alcohol fast bacilli and a TB culture. So they look at it with uh, the zeal Nielsen or Oramine staining just for the um, AAFBs first of all and then they'll culture it. You won't get the culture results back for some time but it's important to just recognise that um, tuberculosis as it was in our causes list, one of, one of the common causes of, um, of an exudated pleural effusion. Yeah, and becoming more common. Yeah, absolutely. Um, triglycerides and cholesterol, yeah, as it says there, they distinguish between tylothorax, but um, I can't remember the last time I did this. Amylase, I'm not sure about this one. So I guess they're looking at um, pancreatitis related effusions, but to be honest with you, um, you you'll probably have your diagnosis on, on the serum amylase rather than the pleural fluid amylase. Um, and, and I think that the amylase crosses quite freely across the, between the serum and the plur, uh, pleural fluid. So I don't really see that there's a great benefit of doing that, but no. it, it, it's um, certainly worth looking at. And of course, the hematocrit, uh, you'll be able to get if you run it through the blood gas machine. Um, but it's important to do this because um, if, if you've got a very bloody stained effusion, it either means that you've punched something on the way in 
or um, or someone's done it before you if there's been an attempted aspiration or it's quite suggestive that there is uh, is a malignancy going on so hematocrit is important as well yeah so what's the relevance of protein and LDH um, as a general figure and this is the way that I, I think about it if you've got lots of protein there's a problem with the um, microcirculation, it's the permeability has been increased um, allowing all that protein to move out of the blood and the magic figure is 30, 30 grams per litre mm -hmm. if it's less than 30 then you can probably say that that the, uh, the, 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 the membrane between the two, the, the, the circulatory membrane is intact, the permeability is normal so it's more likely to be a transudate however saying that the problem is is that sometimes the level of serum protein in the blood so the amount that is to be leaked almost even in the case of a exudate is abnormal um, and also indeed around the 30 point it's quite difficult to apply this rule with any great specificity to say this is definitely an exudate or this is definitely a transudate and this is where this set of criteria called lights criteria um, come in and lights criteria essentially um, allows you to say more definitely whether a pleural aspirate is a transudate or an exudate importantly though you also need serum values so you need serum protein and you need serum LDH as well as just having the um, aspirate versions now I'm not I don't think there's much purpose in, in going through all of this in, in, in a lot of detail but just remember that for borderline cases lights criteria um, is important to apply perfect so what do we do about pleural effusions well that depends doesn't it yeah absolutely on what on the cause so let's go back to the algorithm because uh, that's really useful to look at. So if it's a transudate, um, you're going to give a, tr a trial of treatment as to what you think the cause is and see if it resolves. If you're not getting anywhere, then you're going to refer to a chest physician and you're going to do pleural aspiration and with ultrasound guidance, as we've said before, and send it for all the things you think are necessary. And we've gone through some of those as well. Um, for borderline cases, you'll do the lights criteria to decide whether you think it's an exudate or a transudate. If it is a transudate, treat what you think is the cause. And this cause is going to be identified primarily on your clinical assessment, so your history and your examination. So if you've got someone with a history of ischemic heart disease and they look to be in heart failure on clinical examination, you're probably going to treat them for heart failure. Yeah. Um, and also other investigations may help you on the way. If it's not a transudate, therefore it's an exudate, um, you need to see if the pleural fluid analysis has given you a diagnosis or not, and if there is a diagnosis, treat appropriately. If you don't have a diagnosis, then you're going to think about doing a contrast enhanced CT thorax to try and establish the diagnosis. The difficulty with this is to know whether to do the CT with the pleural fluid in the cavity or whether to drain the pleural fluid or not. Um, and usually they say that if you do a contrast enhanced CT with the patient's pleural effusion still inside them, this is usually better at looking for any pleural um, disease such as mesothelioma because you've got that area of contrast there, but also because the lung is compressed, it's not so good at looking the lung parenchyma. So you might want to drain it and then uh, do a CT scan and this shows you the lung parenchyma and that may be important if you're looking for say lung cancer or, or anything else. Hmm. One for the chest physicians to argue about. Absolutely. Um, there's also this, uh, the, uh, the diagnostic algorithm splits here into two and on the left hand side we've got um, consider LA stands for local anaesthetic thoracoscopy which is where um, usually the physicians have a little look into the chest through a small incision like a, uh, one of the large bore surgical chest strains but we pop in a small um, fibre optic cam camera and have a look or a, surgically, uh, a surgical procedure called a VATS which is video assisted thoroscopic surgery where they essentially do the same thing but have the benefit of being able to sort out any problem once they're in there 
the other side of the algorithm is whether you should consider um, a, a pleural biopsy. And these used, used to be done blindly by big, nasty Abrams needles, um, but now more frequently they are radiologically guided, so you usually get a CT guided pleural biopsy. Um, and they do say here that you can insert a chest drain if the patient has symptoms and, and you want to drain it. And so symptoms are like breathlessness or you may they may have mediastinal shift, as we said before, that you want to at the same time as doing the biopsy enter in a drain. If there's a cause, then you're going to treat it in, in the usual way. And if there's no cause, we're a bit stuck. And we need to reconsider the history and examination carefully and consider other treatable conditions such as pulmonary embolism, tuberculosis, and uh, and some of the hematological malignancies. Yep. So that's that's it. That's all you need to know. Good. Well, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us nicely to the end of this podcast. Um, just to recap, we've discussed quite a few things. Um, lots of things obviously about pleural effusions, but also quite a lot of stuff surrounding basic clinical examination skills, basic ways of uh, thinking about um, causes of things, differential diagnosis, investigations and things like that. Um, this format has been a little bit different to the normal normal one. It's not to say that this is going to completely replace the podcast that we we always do, um, but it might be something new just to, to do occasionally. Um, I've had a good time. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. So especially if you like it and you've enjoyed and you want to hear more of this kind of style of podcast, then just let us know and uh, the email address is on the screen. So contact at podmedics.com. Very inventive email address. Yep, okay. very good. Thanks, Stephen. And um, okay. we'll see you again soon. Bye. Yep, see you soon. Bye-bye.